Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see so many of you uh, here again. We're looking at the road to atonement. It's a journey we began last night with a study. And the basic premise is that we are actually walking the same road that Jesus did. The reason that the Gospels give us so much information as to the last days of Jesus' mortal discipleship is because he visits certain places where we will also have to go. The first stage was the upper room at the Last Supper, which we reenact every Sunday morning. And so last night we tried to go to the upper room with Jesus and observe what he was doing and why. See him disrobed to wash the feet of his disciples and consider the fact that the absence of the bread and wine in John's retelling, focusing on the Passover model, taught us that the basis of our identity in Christ isn't sharing the meal together, that the basis of our identity in Christ is the actions we perform because we shared the meal together, those marks of blood. It's also based and provoked as an idea from these words that Simon, Simon Peter, spoke to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? And we took the interpretation, a very positive interpretation of these words, that Jesus isn't telling him he's going to the cross and Peter too will follow him to death, but that Jesus is ultimately going to the presence of the Father. Where I am going, to the Father, you cannot follow now, Peter. And then these last words become beautiful, but you will follow later. They become words of assurance and encouragement. You, Peter, will be granted the grace to be with the Father in the fullness of time. So that's where we were last night, and from there then, we're ready to walk on that road and follow Jesus and walk with him as he goes to the very next uh, station stop on this road to atonement, which is the Garden of Gethsemane. If it's helpful, I should remind you that what I understand by atonement is what the inventor of the word Tyndale originally meant, that it's uh, spelt very deliberately, not a coincidence, that these are the two words at one, which Tyndale put together to make this word. This is a road to at one -ment. Our entire goal in life is to become at one with God. And as John will later point out in his, his epistles, you cannot become at one with God until you are first, or at least prepared, to be at one with your brothers and sisters who seek the same thing. So it's a question of becoming at one with our brothers and sisters and a question of becoming at one with God. This is the path Jesus walked to becoming at one with his Father, and we are invited to the same journey. So then, here we are at prayer in the garden. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. For context, this directly follows that Last Supper uh, that we were at and, and looking at last night uh, in the upper room. Now, straight away, there's a bit of a problem. Because it says Jesus went out. Now, if you were here last night, you might remember that we said, well, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And we rightly lambasted Judas, saying, well, that was the wrong thing to do, wasn't it? Because it was Passover night, or at least they were enacting the Passover. And the law of Passover said, not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. And we, so we said, Judas essentially condemned himself and went out of the house and ran into the angel of death in the streets. And now Jesus has done the same thing. How then can we say that Judas has done the wrong thing by going out, and that Jesus has not likewise sinned by going out. How do we explain that? I wonder if you've ever considered that. And perhaps the answer is simpler that we might suppose. In Exodus 12, back in the Old Testament days, this was a foreshadowing of the Christ that would come. So in the Old Testament, the house that you should not leave all night was a physical structure. It was your house. Do not go out of the front door or climb out of a window. Do not leave your house. But of course, in the New Testament, we've stepped up a little bit. We've stepped up to the spiritual plane. So the house that should not be left is the company of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our house. That is the spiritual house we've, we've built. So it's still correct to say Judas had sadly condemned himself by leaving the house. He left the company of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus walked out of the building, he, of course, did not leave the company of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the Lord Jesus Christ. He never leaves the house 
because he is the house. And you might say, well, okay. And the disciples, the faithful disciples, they also walked out of the physical house with Jesus, and therefore they didn't leave the spiritual house. But they did later. They did later. They, they fled from the Garden of Gethsemane. So aren't they too condemned like Judas? And the answer is, of course, yes. There were 12 traitors that night, not one. The only difference being that of the 12 that betrayed him that night, 11 saw the grace of God and saw the opportunity for repentance. And that counts for us too. Can I honestly tell you I have not betrayed Christ? Of course I have. Am I worthy to stand here and address you? Of course I'm not. But you invite me to anyway, and I'm pleased to be able to do so. But I don't deserve to be here. I have betrayed Christ, but I'm aware of the, of the penitence available, of the repentance available to come back to the company. So in the New Testament, it's a spiritual house, the company of Jesus, which Jesus never left, and which, yes, the other disciples also left and betrayed him, but returned at a later time. So, having covered the potential problem of that subclause, let's just notice the next one, because that's rather attractive. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And as we know in the narrative, the reason that he's going there is that he's going to pray. Prayer was something that he usually did. It was, something, it was a practice in which he was commonly established. Makes me mindful of uh, Job, a very faithful man from the Old Testament. Early in the morning, Job would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children. This was Job's regular custom. Early in the morning, as usual, Job would pray and sacrifice on behalf of his children. And in the evening, Jesus went out as usual to the Garden of Gethsemane on the lower western slopes of uh, the Mount of Olives. A man regularly dedicated to prayer for others, both Jesus and Job. This is a man God uses in the salvation of their friends. Jesus is the ultimate source of salvation for so many people, as, as many as want to, truth to tell. And Job was also used by God in the salvation of his three friends. Job can be a complicated and difficult book, but uh, if we ever want to know what was the value of the suffering of Job, there are many answers. And one of the simplest ones is to say, well, look, at the, at the front end of the book, You've got Job heading for the kingdom of God and his three friends heading for destruction. One life out of four will be saved. And at the end of the book, you've got Job and his three friends, all four, heading for the kingdom of God. If nothing else, the suffering of the righteous man helped bring salvation to the unrighteous man. And how, how, how is that for a, su a summary of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? So I say this. Why do I say this? Because I want the opportunity. I want it. I would love to be utilized in the salvation of my friends who are currently heading for oblivion, some of which more obviously than others. What a wonderful thing to be able to do. Wouldn't you want that? So I say to myself, what do I see in the Bible? How do I become one of those that God says, okay, all right, I'll use you. This is it. A man who prays for the salvation of his friends regularly. A man for whom it's his regular custom, who does it as usual. This is the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see it quite well reflected in Job. So if I can be a man who is regularly involved in the prayer for salvation of those whom I love, then there's the opportunity, I have that opportunity, to be one of those that God may take. And that opportunity is not just available to me, of course, it is available to everyone in this room. So it's a powerful thing, uh, prayer in that way. Here's Jesus' prayer, again, for others. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for the, those you have given me, for they are yours. And likewise, Job. God says, my servant Job will pray for you, Eliphaz, and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. So the three friends did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. An interesting fact, then, the road to atonement focuses on the atonement of others. It's when the atonement of other people is central to my mind and central to my prayers that I am walking the right road. Are my prayers focused on the needs of others? If there were a printout immediately to appear from my laptop magically of the last five prayers I'd given, 
and they appeared on the screen, would we really see that the needs of others were focused? What about your prayers? We investigate that uh, internally ourselves. And so we come to that critical central scene, the scene in Gethsemane of Jesus submitting to the Father. Now, you didn't come here for uh, any uh, sort of uh, lessons in first principle doctrine, nor do I intend to particularly give any, but I can't help but notice we've stumbled across uh, a very uh, obvious and a very central one. This is the scene more than any other in the scriptures that really insists that Jesus and God are fundamentally different beings. Much of the language about the pseudo-Trinitarian or non-Trinitarian language in the scripture can be interpreted and slanted and weighted and twisted different ways. But this scene philosophically demands that there are two different beings. Why? Because it shows, above all else, the concept of obedience and the concept of submission. And there cannot be obedience and there cannot be submission unless you have more than one being in play. I cannot be obedient to myself. I cannot submit to myself. So when Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, I don't want to do this. And yet, if I must, I will. Your will must take precedence over mine. If Jesus is God, there is no distinction between obedience and self-indulgence. You're being obedient to what you already wanted to do. You may in yourself have two different ideas and be caught between two two choices, should I do this or that, but in the end you choose the one you prefer, the one you believe to be most beneficial. That's not submission. That's choice. That's not obedience. That's preference. There is no submission and there is no obedience unless Jesus is a fundamentally separate character from the Father. So while I don't come here for the purposes of first principle doctrine, we can't help but notice that this is the most powerful scene in the whole Bible for demonstrating the difference between the Son of God and God the Father himself. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. It was in the will of God, as the Son had found out, that he must die. And why did he have to die? There's some reasons we'll explore tomorrow, but we'll put one up uh, right at the moment. And I needed a metaphor for this, and I thought long and hard to see if I could find one. And what we need is a metaphor for absolute sin, for the most evil creation that has ever existed on the face of planet Earth. And I found one, and it's that, clearly. Because if you've ever had the misfortune to connect with one of these beasts you'll realize they never go where you want them to. And you have your will and directive, and they will immediately fly off stage left into something expensive at at your cost and embarrassment. Some things inherently want to run off straight, and the shopping trolley is, uh, in, in my view, the emblemization of entirely that. What is it that the shopping trolley is, is, really, uh, is really a metaphor for? It's for the human spirit. The human spirit does not want to follow God, right? and, and neither did Jesus. Is Jesus different from us? Absolutely, in that he was victorious. Every time there was a struggle, every time there was a temptation, Jesus won. Jesus, if you like, and I don't mi- wish to make a ridiculous scene involving Jesus, but Jesus kept the trolley straight. How much effort must that have been? that several, many times per day, that trolley wants to go off straight and he just has the fundamental spiritual forearms to keep it going in a straight line as it should. But notice, that's not perfection. That's not a perfect life. That's not even a particularly pleasant life. Jesus had our inherent desire to sin. This is stuff we fundamentally know his mortal body couldn't actually realize his godly intent. Even though he won every fight against the thing wanting to run off straight, his mortal body couldn't realize, and Paul backs it up, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Yet his father had promised, and you'll find in the Psalms of David, that death is not legally allowed to hold those who are holy. The Holy One will not be permitted to, 
to see corruption. And so therefore, if he could trust the Father and resign that mortal body as something that could never fulfill his godly intent or his Father's intent, then his Father would likewise provide for him a life beyond that. And how difficult must that be? Jesus is still human. How difficult is it to allow your life to be laid down in trust that it will be taken up again later? Fighting the wobbly shopping trolley for eternity, even successfully, isn't perfection. It's punishing. And Jesus must have been very tired to be that successful, that perfectly successful, and having won every fight. But God wants his children and his only son most of all. He wants us to enjoy perfection, not just victory over something which is constantly ripping us in two different directions. And I think one of the greatest things about the kingdom, should we have the chance to experience it, will be the single-mindedness that we own. That everything that we should be doing is everything that we want to be doing. And speaking for myself, that's not my current life. And that's just some of the reason my hair turns gray. Your attitude, says Paul, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He didn't want to grasp at equality with God. What scene does that make you think of, the idea of grasping at something you should have left alone? Yeah, absolutely. Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, she grasped some, may I say, and ate it. So she couldn't, and and of course, the fruit of the tree was good, but realize, of course, it's not the fruit that was all that tempting. She wasn't after the fruit. It wasn't like it was especially luscious. The point is that the fruit gave a chance to become equal with God. If you take this fruit, says the serpent, you will be like God. Equality with God is dangling from this tree. And so whatever fruit it was doesn't matter. She took it and she grabbed it because equality with God is what humans want to grasp at in their own time. You will not surely die. That was the promise, says the serpent. But God knows that when you will eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, if Eve's mind wasn't drowned with temptation, she would, I'm sure, have been smart enough to realize that cannot be true. There's actually a logical error in what's written on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you've stopped uh, to really consider it. But let's imagine, for some tragic example, you want to be like me. If you want to be like me, you have to do the things that I do. You have to wear, poor choices, the things that I wear. You have to like, have the tastes in food and music and goodness knows what else that I have. If you want to be like me, you have to be like me. I seem to have spoken something so simple it's foolish, but, but in actual fact, this is what the serpent, this is what the promise of the serpent is actually not giving. God said, don't eat the tree. What the serpent is saying, let me translate it, is, if you want to be like God, do the opposite of what God would do. Well, that can't be right, can it? That's how to be anti-God, to do the opposite of what God would do. There is actually a logical flaw here. The principle is simple. You don't become God by being ungodly. So the serpent says, if you just be ungodly and do the opposite of what God wants, that will make you like God. But of course it won't. It actually takes you completely the other way. But Eve was too drowned by temptation to spot the logical error, and so she did. Instead, your attitude should be the same as Jesus, who, being in very nature God, took the very nature of the serpent, servant. Not the serpent. Very different. Aside, so is Jesus actually God? Because it says, very nature God. I've t- deliberately taken this most awkward of translations so that we can confront it. Is Jesus actually God? No, of course not. We've already seen the concepts of submission and obedience in the garden cannot exist unless you have two different creatures. And more importantly... The manner in which Jesus was very God wasn't his biology. It's not saying your biology should be the same as Jesus. It says your attitude should be the same as Jesus. 
So was Jesus actually just like God in attitude? Absolutely. That's not a problem at all. He was in very nature God when the nature is understood to be the attitude, which is what the context says, not the biology. But there's more complex stuff in here as well. Being like God, he took the very nature of the servant, and the verse continues, and therefore God gave him the name which is above every name, and he actually earns the name of God. And so we ask, did God exalt Jesus because he humbled himself as a servant, which is the opposite role to a God? In other words, if Jesus headed downwards to the rank of servant, did God say, well, because you've gone down to the rank of servant, I'm going to lift you all the way up to the rank of God? And that's an understanding I used to have as a younger man. And there are verses that seem to support this. James says, what does this one say? This one says, uh, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. It does say that exactly. Is that what, what he's saying? And the answer is I'm going to suggest no. I've done a few things in life and, and some, some are quite random. And some require training. And some of the things you've done in life require training. And I'm going to ask you to think about one thing you're qualified to do and what the training was like to get there. Of course, I don't know what the answers are. But I'm going to suggest to you that whatever it is you're trained in and that you were trained to do, the training was basically imitating the job itself. For example, I've jumped out of an airplane. This wasn't the smartest thing in all the world to do, but it did raise some money for charity, so there you go. So I've skydived. Now, the, the, the diving out of the plane is, is actually really easy. Well, the hard part is actually hitting the ground without killing yourself. So, so I've landed on the ground from a great height. So what was the training required to do that? Well, unsurprisingly, it was landing on the ground. It was jumping off increasingly higher things and learning how to hit the ground without actually breaking your ankles. That was the point. So the training was exactly what I was going to do. I've been trained, currently trained, to drive forklift trucks for random reasons. Guess what the training is to drive a forklift truck? They put you on a forklift truck and say, off you go, have a go at that. And they make sure that all the sort of life and flesh is out of the way because they don't actually kill anything. And you just squish a few cones until they tell you to get off and try again tomorrow. And eventually, when you don't massacre enough plastic cones, they let you out in the real world and you drive a forklift truck. So to, drive, to be a forklift truck driver, you drive a forklift truck as training. And to be a skydiver or someone who hits the ground at speed, you show that you can hit the ground at speed without hurting yourself too much. Okay? The training is the job. So why, why would God say, well, my son, wants, I, I wish him to be elevated to the role of God, and that's good because he's taken the opposite role. He's done something completely different, and by doing something completely different, he is now qualified to do this thing over here. That's not logical. In fact, it violates the central principle we said. You don't become God by being ungodly. So this can't be the opposite of being a God. This must be godliness. Jesus behaved like God, and so God said, I will now recognize you as God because you behaved like God. So this is becoming quite fundamental. God rewards Jesus with his name for becoming a servant because that's who God really is. Now that may, I truly hope that's not offensive, but that may be a new concept, the idea that God is the ultimate servant. Let's see if we can justify that from the scriptures. My words are certainly not enough. In one of the lovely long speeches he gives to Job, God expands on this theme quite explicitly. And this is a paraphrase, but he says, the stars... He says, it's like I keep them in my shed. There's a lot of metaphor here. Keep them in my garden shed. Every night I pull out all the stars and I lead them to where they need to be. I shepherd them into place so that they're all in the right spot every night. It's a metaphor, of course. He says, when the lions and the ravens need to eat, I prepare the food. I prepare the food for them. I cook for them. I'm their chef. And when that mountain goat is ready to give birth and is bleating halfway up the craggy mountain slope, it's me, almighty God, who hikes up that slope and delivers that baby goat. I am a midwife to the mountain goats, says God. We are commended to the servant's role because it is God's role. It's the right form of training. We don't serve now so that we can rule in the kingdom. We serve now 
so that we can serve in the kingdom because that's what ruling is. It won't be different. And that's the beautiful thing that comes out of understanding what God is trying to teach us here. Here's a key verse that helps explain that. God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself is too busy doing all the serving for everything, for everyone. And that's the beauty of how God expresses himself. He says, I am God. I am the ultimate king because I serve. And I want you to be kings and priests. I want you to be gods, Psalm 82. And you'll do that if you understand what the training for that is. If you understand that I am the ultimate servant and you learn to serve. Jesus had the same attitude as God, so Jesus ruled through service as God does. God saw Jesus behave the same way he does, so he gave Jesus the same name he has. And therefore Jesus is everlasting father, mighty counselor, whatever names God has, they belong to Jesus because he had the identical attitude and learned what a king really was. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus. Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And there is only one name above every name and that is the name of Yahweh. And God says, I am pleased for you, my son, to wear my name because you have understood who I am and what I do. And that's a beautiful, powerful thing. You see it happening right there in Gethsemane. That's where Jesus says, I understand, ich dien, I serve. There's some interesting little things we can notice about the choreography of Gethsemane. I I don't make a huge deal about this, but it's rather attractive to point out. Here's a little map, obviously not to scale, uh, from a very poor artist. And Jerusalem is essentially on these twin peaks of Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. We're looking north, so west is this way and east is over there. And the Mount of Olives, which is taller than those mountains, uh, is uh, over here on the eastern side, uh, separated from them by the Kidron Valley. And the Garden of Gethsemane is uh, an olive garden, of course, on the lower slopes of uh, Mount Olivet. And so what happens is we have two verses here in in John, and you can see they're quite a long way apart. They're four chapters apart. Come now, let us leave, says Jesus. And when he'd finished praying, Jesus left and crossed the Kidron Valley. So he leaves twice. That's not a problem because he's got two things to leave. I believe at the end of the supper, he says, come now, let us leave. And they leave the physical house, wherever that was in Jerusalem, and they walk out into the streets. And then, so think about it this way. John 15, John 16, John 17 is Jesus traveling in the company of his disciples along, uh, across Jerusalem. And if he leaves by the eastern gate, because he must, because he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane, that final prayer that he gives is at the temple. Maybe he even went into the outer courts, I don't know. But it's standing at the temple that he offers that final prayer. And then when he'd finished praying, he left the city, not the house now, he left the city, and straight away, of course, he crosses the Kidron Valley. And this is, this is what happens. So Jesus and his 11 remaining apostles go into the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and goes a stone's throw further into the garden and prays, and they all fall asleep. And then Jesus himself goes a stone's throw even further. So Jesus is actually at the highest point. He's also at the easternmost point. Uh, and behind and coming behind is Judas with the whatever mob he brought to a, a take... Um, Uh, Jesus, and then back in Jerusalem is, of course, Caiaphas, who's keeping his hands clean, and even though he's pulling all the strings, he's not getting directly involved. Why do we care about that? We care about that for this reason. Often the temple is thought to be a very holy place, and it was, but not for long. In the time of Ezekiel, God says, and I'm paraphrasing, you can see it in chapter 10, he says, you are so repugnant to me now, I'm leaving. I'm leaving the temple. And you see that the spirit of the God moves and it sort of dawdles by the doors if it has some great reluctance and some poignance to leave. And it goes away to the east and up. Specifics not given, but it leaves the temple to the east and up. And after that, the temple is empty. And I think sometimes we do a disservice to ourselves when we think of the temple as this very holy place when the Bible has told us, no, it's, it's devoid of God now. God's glory has gone elsewhere. And east and up, I'm just 
speculating, I'm just going to put the glory of God or the central focus of his power above the Mount of Olives. The reason I do that is because I think when Jesus ascended to the Father, where did he ascend from? He didn't ascend from Damascus. He didn't ascend from Jerusalem. He didn't ascend from the temple. He ascended from the Mount of Olives. It's as if that's where he knew where to go to find the Father. And not only did he ascend upwards uh, to the presence of the Father from the, the Mount of Olives, but we're told in Acts, of course, this same Jesus, whom you have seen ascend into heaven, shall, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him ascend. And so this is actually the place of the Advent. As we know, Jesus will return not to Mount Moriah or Mount Zion even, but he will actually return to the Mount of Olives. This is therefore a place set apart for the will of God, a very holy place. And I think it's useful to know that. This is an aside I won't pursue. Think of these words that Jesus says, and he wants us to understand them. When you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand then let, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I think we've often tried to, to find uh, interpretations of that prophecy that center around at the Temple Mount, and I don't think, I think we're, we're struggling there because I think the place being referred to is the Mount of Olives, and that has a clear, helpful interpretation when we look at the events of AD 70, and I think they will be repeated again. But the holy place that uh, Daniel has spoken of is right there. It's not over here at all, and that helps us uh, perhaps understand some of the events that are coming before the return of Christ. That's beyond our scoop, scope for today. Meanwhile, we have this array of people laid out like this. Why do we have all that geographical detail in our Bible? You know how the temple is laid out. The Gentiles are outside the temple in, in those outer courts. Only Jews can come into the court of women, and only male Jews can then proceed into uh, the, the, male, the men's court only priests, that is, male Jews of the house of Levi, can come inside the structure, and only one person, the high priest, who is a male Jew Levite of the uh, lineage of Aaron, can go into the holy place. So there's a holiness line laid out west to east. The most holy are on the west, the least holy are in the east. And so when we take that pattern and we translate it across, we have the most holy person is Caiaphas, then Judas and his mob, then the apostles, then Peter, James, and John, and the one on the outside, the least holy person of all, appears to be Jesus of Nazareth. That is if the temple model is still valid. But God's left the temple. And according, the glory of God has departed east and up, whether here or elsewhere, who knows? And so in the divine scheme, you kind of are invited to, describe, to understand that the other way around. Jesus has come closest to the actual presence of the Father, even in this physical choreography. And Peter, James, and John are behind him, and the rest of the apostles behind him, and the men who will arrest him behind him. And the one who's actually outside of the presence of God completely is Caiaphas, the high priest. And it's, it's interesting that it's all laid out in such an explicit manner that way. So what then happens in the garden? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. And Jesus said, no more of this, and healed the man. Peter could be forgiven for his confusion here, uh, had not his Lord requested that they bring swords. If you don't have a sword, he says at the Last Supper, sell your cloak and buy one. Uh, I make no apology just for repeating one slide from yesterday, we actually saw that Jesus said, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. But according to Isaiah 59, uh, the cloak represented zealous vengeance. That was how Isaiah translated it. And the sword, of course, was the word of God. So what Jesus was actually saying was, shed zealous vengeance. Take your cloak to one side and allow the sword instead to come to fruition. Allow the will of God to happen. So in this sense, the spiritual world is opposite to the natural world, right? Garments, are, these are the least, of all the things I possess, the last thing I can use as a weapon is my shirt. And yet, Isaiah says, no, 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 it's the garments that are vengeful. And the best thing I could use as a weapon is a sword. But if it's the word of God saying, stand down and, and let the glory of the Lord happen, that's actually the other way around. It's the least chance or the least justification I have to attack anyone. So there's this lovely inversion 
that the peaceful word of God is the sword and the uh, harmless clothes are actually the zealous vengeance that Jesus once set aside. I might say, well then, how do I wield my sword, my Bible? What is my Bible for when I am in discussion about the word of God? In one of the verses we commonly hear that to justify some of the contentious uh, argumentative activity that we get into is uh, this verse from Jude. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. And we use that word contend perhaps to justify a lot more argument than, than perhaps is actually called for. Um, perhaps we could just, just explore this word. There it is in Greek. I've separated off the grammatical uh, start and end which just uh, form the case structure that it fits it in the sentence. Here's the core of the word itself. And if you read Greek, you'll, you'll be able to see what that says. This is alpha, the letter A. This is gamma, the letter G. Uh, omega, the letter O. Nu, the letter N. And so we can actually translate that letter for letter. And that says agonize. You see, what Jude had actually called for was not contentiousness. Jude had actually said, I felt I had to write and urge you to agonize for the faith. Well, what does that mean? I, I can't know 100%, but agonizing to me suggests an internal effort on my part to wrestle with the Bible, to understand what it truly means, to pray for understanding and, and receive what God gives me. It's a contending within, I suggest to you, not being contentious without. And so that, that changed a lot of the style that I had when I interacted with uh, disciples of other faiths and still tried to win them over, perhaps a little less contentiously than I used to, because I realized this doesn't actually mean contentiousness at all. It means agonize. So that was helpful to me, and I, I share it for you. I think that's the kind of sword play that Jesus wants when we're in the garden. When we're in the garden of Gethsemane, we're wrestling with all the things we wrestle with in our lives. This is the sword play for which Jesus has called. So what use then is prayer? Here's how prayer was useful to Jesus. He used it for re rejuvenation and for resisting temptation. Those verses there are the times when he's been walking on the water and he's had a lot of emotional draining from the miracles he's performed. And he says, it's time for me to withdraw now. I'm going up a mountain to be alone with my father and pray with him. And Jesus uses the prayer for something else. He identifies it as a source of miraculous healing. The disciples can't cast demons out of a particularly... Uh, medically ill person, and Jesus says, well, I can, and it's because of prayer. Only through prayer can this come. So Jesus uses this to resist temptation and to perform miraculous healing. If it's true that we are walking the same road that Jesus did, then we should be using prayer the same way. Is that fair? And you might say, well, not really, no, because we don't have the Spirit of God without measure like he did, so we can't do miraculous healing. Well, actually... We can. Or so says the Bible. Is any among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up again. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So I see this in resisting temptation, and I see it here. What Jesus did, we do. The road Jesus walks, we walk. Source of miraculous healing, we pray, and we're promised, if that prayer is often in, offered in faith, that that healing can come at the hands of the Lord. So, resisting temptation, rejuvenation, source of miraculous healing, there, that's the road Jesus walks, and this is the road we walk, according to James. We walk the same road Jesus did. We are alongside him, and we have no... Uh, allowance to just abdicate our responsibilities and say, I don't have the powers that Jesus had, therefore I don't have to do what he did. I can't abdicate that way. And if we want to learn about prayer, and you might wonder why we had that reading of the parable of the prodigal son, our brother might think, why was I reading that as it hasn't come up at all? Uh, we need to investigate the nature of my prayers, and I'm going to take you to a very strange place to do that, and that is the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son teaches many things, but lying there in the background is a most magnificent instruction on the nature of prayer. Neither of the two, uh, the two boys are, are real. Jesus has invented them both as hypothetical characters. Nevertheless, there was a man who had two sons. 
And what we'll see, if you have those pages open in front of you, is two prayers. Both prayers are offered by that younger son, the so-called prodigal, and I want us to finish by looking at what those two prayers said. There's two very different prayers here. And I put them on the screen, if you you can look up instead of down, as is your choice. There was a man who had two sons. The younger son said, Father, give me my share of the estate. Okay, so that's the first prayer. And I'm going to summarize it with just three words, taken directly from the text. Father, give me. Give me what? It doesn't really matter. That's an attitude. Father, give me. I'm just going to sit here. You do the work. Give me what I want. Thank you. Okay. Father, give me. In fact, we can probably lose the quote because we've got everything we need here. And then Jesus tells this story that the, the young man undergoes a transformation. And, and he, Jesus describes that transformation as a return to sanity. And Jesus says, when that young man came to his senses... He prayed like this. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer be worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Father, make me. And again, I think we can probably lose the rest of the quote. We have everything that we need. So there are two prayers. In his young and reckless state, Father, give me. But when he came to his senses, Father, give me make me. Again, the challenge has to go out to you and to me. Your last five prayers, ten prayers, fifty prayers, how are they best summarized? Are they Father, give me? Or are they Father, make me? Which one is my prayer? And what's essentially the difference? The difference is here, only one party is doing the giving. But if we want to be remodeled, retooled, refashioned, then there has to be giving from both sides to make this happen. This is a cooperative effort in making a new disciple. This is simple charity. Not that God will necessarily refuse this prayer. Notice that the father in the parable says, okay. And he gives him everything he asks with that sort of background hint of be careful what you wish for. This isn't going to be the dream you think it is. In fact, we can even approach the bread and wine of the upper room the same way. What is our prayer internally as we pass bread and wine from hand to hand on a Sunday morning? Father, give me this bread. Father, give me this wine. Father, give me forgiveness. All are freely given. Or can we find it in ourselves to generate that thought which says, Father, with this bread and with this wine, make me that better disciple that I desire to be yet cannot be alone. That's the essence of the prayers that we see as drawn from the example, ultimately, of Gethsemane. My prayer in the garden, we've seen a few things, but for the one take-home message I'd leave you, do I pray, Father, give me, or do I pray, Father, make me?